Good morning, afternoon, or evening, or whatever it is you're watching this. I appreciate you taking the time to ignore your job or your family or the haunting disembodied voices that keep telling you to put a turbocharger on your motorcycle and instead taking a moment for yourself to get educated. Before we get too far, make sure you're in a nice comfortable chair, maybe make yourself some chamomile tea or pour a couple fingers worth of whiskey because you're going to need something to help wash down this bad news. Okay, you ready? Inline four motorcycles are going extinct. What? Yeah, you heard that right. They're going the way of the dodo bird. Give it another 10 years and you may very well have better luck finding Jimmy Hoffa's body than the inline four on the showroom floor. I hate to be the one to break it to you, but I've got the numbers right here. Prognosis negative. No one cares about MotoGP anymore. People are thirsty for torque in lieu of peak horsepower, and Zoomers would rather cosplay as Tommy from Peaky Blinders on their Triumph Bonneville than go 186 miles per hour down the freeway. So let's take a minute to look a little closer at the inline four motorcycle engine and see what its potentially bleak future could look like. But first, let me shout out today's sponsor, Manscaped. I'll tell more about them later in the video. Make sure you click that notification bell so you can always check our daily uploads early. Okay, maybe I was spiraling there for a second. Extinct is a strong word, but the prevalence of inline four engines is definitely waning as people gravitate towards more streetable naked or neo retro style bikes, but it wasn't always that way. Cue the old timey Ken Burns documentary music, the inline four motorcycle engine date back to the early 1900s where most of its innovation was pioneered by William Henderson. Through multiple mergers and acquisitions, Henderson developed inline four-cylinder motorcycles for Henderson, Excelsior, and Ace motorcycle companies, the latter being ultimately bought out by Indian in 1927. Excelsior motorcycles owned by Schwinn Bicycles had developed an industry-leading four-cylinder motorcycle that was capable of reaching 100 miles per hour in the late 1920s. Jesus Christ, going 100 miles per hour on one of these bikes feels just about as safe as going 100 on a bird scooter. After the stock market crash of 1929, they discontinued Excelsior and would stick to producing affordable bicycles which were more easier to sell during the depression. Manufacturers think they have it tough now with the global pandemic and impending economic recession. Imagine trying to hustle motorcycles during the Great Depression and two world wars. Hey look, I know your family of six is eating raw potatoes for every meal, but I'd like to speak about you to the benefits of Yeet Energy. Indian also produced a motorcycle with a four-cylinder engine called the Indian 4 original. Interestingly, the four-cylinder motorcycle engines of this era were mounted longitudinally in line with the frame, not transverse like you would see in the late 60s and onwards. Indian made their four-cylinder motorcycle up until 1941 when falling sales and production limitations from the war effort forced them to stop production. MV Agusta was actually the first manufacturer to pursue a resurgence of inline four motorcycle engines in the 1960s. Like a lot of advancements in motorcycling in this time period, MV had first developed the engine for implementation on the racetrack before putting it into production in the 600 GT. Commercially, the 600 GT kind of tanked because there wasn't enough pretentious riders at the time who wanted to refer to their motorcycles as art instead of actually riding them. It wasn't until Honda developed the CB750 in 1967 that inline four cylinder motorcycle engines became the gold standard for speed and performance. We have a whole deep dive video on the Honda and the CB750, so you've won all the nitty gritty details on that. So for today's purposes, I will try to keep the CB750 simping to a minimum. In short, Honda wanted to develop a motorcycle geared towards American riders. Their smaller displacement motorcycles just weren't equipped to schlep around real corn-fred patriots like Harley and Indian could with their big V-twin engines. In order to compete, they opted to build what they called the king of motorcycles. The CB750 had a 750cc transverse inline four engine that left more room in the frame and provided optimal air cooling across all four cylinders. This motorcycle was such a success it changed the paradigm for production motorcycles and created a new expectation for high performing four cylinder engines. The CB750 gave way to the UJM era where the big four were neck and neck in creating the biggest and fastest four cylinder standard motorcycles like the Z1 from Kawasaki and the XS1100 from Yamaha. The inline four may be going extinct but do you know what else is? Harry Balls. That's right guys, it's time to get with the program. You've been hearing the snickers in the locker room, you're the last of a dying breed of bush dwellers, and you do not want to fall into obscurity only to be recognized as a relic of the Paleolithic age. Luckily, Manscaped has got you covered. Give yourself the Maypole makeover you deserve with the Platinum Package 4.0. The Platinum Package comes with the Skin Safe Lawnmower 4.0 Trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, and Crop Reviver Toner Spray, plus a handful of other other goodies to get you feeling like a modern man instead of a Cro-Magnon from the Natural History Museum. 
If you follow the link below, you'll get 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com slash yammy for 20% off plus free shipping. Thanks, Manscaped. Now back to the program. The inline four-cylinder became the engine of choice for powerful sporty motorcycles because of their smooth and balanced power, reliability, and fitment. Every top-tier leader bike or 600cc class motorcycle from the past two decades has come equipped with a transverse four-cylinder engine. Except the Daytona, of course because we have to be different. This engine style became so ubiquitous they even started to find their way into small displacement bikes in the 90s. Bikes like the CBR 250RR or the Baby Blade had its own 249cc four-cylinder engine with the 19,000 RPM redline, which is absolutely ridiculous, cool in its own right, but downright unnecessary. Similarly, the Kawasaki ZX2R, the Suzuki GSX250, and the Yamaha FZR250R were all 250cc baby sport bikes rocking astronomically high revving four-cylinder engines. Could you imagine seeing a 250cc four-cylinder on the showroom floor in 2022? Modern engines can make more power with a single cylinder or parallel twin engine than a small inline four with significantly less manufacturing costs from all the extra parts needed for the little extra cylinders. A huge part of the purpose of a small displacement motorcycle is to attract new riders, and having extra manufacturing costs for more cylinders would mean a higher sticker price. One of the major reasons that inline four engines are becoming less popular is because sport bikes in general are becoming less popular. The glory days of the mid 2000s where everyone wanted to pretend to be Valentino Rossi are quite frankly behind us. If you look at the 10 most popular motorcycles sold in 2019, there is only one four cylinder sport bike on it, it's the Ninja ZX6R. And let's be honest, Kawasaki riders aren't usually the brightest of the bunch, and it wouldn't surprise me if there are some out there who still think it's 2007. In the era of self-care and manifestation, younger riders without health insurance are praying to their tarot cards that they don't have back problems by their early 30s, and are opting out of the fast boy lifestyle in favor of motorcycle with more agreeable ergonomics. There is no denying that a high revving super sport motorcycle is going to make a ton of peak power, but for a vast majority of motorcyclists, that is completely impractical for 99% of street use. There's really Really not any instance where revving a bike out to 15,000 RPM is at all preferable to a naked bike that makes its peak torque at half of that. Yamaha making the R7 is significant in their acknowledgement that many riders prefer usable low-end power rather than peak performance. With torque forward, naked bikes becoming more sought out options for riders looking for sporty motorcycles with everyday rideability, it seems like the inline four engine may soon be dethroned as the engine configuration of choice if it hasn't already by the parallel twin. Not only are riders moving away from sport bikes for the compromised ergonomics and inconvenient power band, but also for the lack of character. We are in the peak sensitive millennial marketing era where consumers are responding better to ethereal themes and sensations rather than technical specifications, unless you exist on our Discord server where everybody is a spec sheet warrior for some reason. While this can be seen happening across the board, I mean, come on, have you seen that tear jerker of a Dove Soap ad? It's also happening in motorcycling. I feel like we talk about the heritage, nostalgia, and character of a bike as often as we do its power figure these days because that's what many people are motivated by. And in that spirit, an inline four sport bike just doesn't fit the bill for character. Aside from the R1, the exhaust note and the engine sound is typically pretty plain compared to a cross-plane twin, inline triple, V-twin, or even a brappy single. And the bikes themselves don't elicit the same emotional connection that a retro-style bike does either. Most of a fully fared sport bike looks are derived from the utilitarian purpose more than stylistic design. Every aspect of those motorcycles are based on going as fast as possible on a racetrack and have no interest in that athletic lineage, you won't have the same appreciation for the looks that a MotoGP enthusiast or true fast boy would. The most motorcycles sold in America are from harley Davidson's. So that should tell you something about how people base their decisions when buying a motorcycle. But unlike Harley boomers, younger people are becoming increasingly interested in retro style bikes like the Triumph Bonneville, Ducati Scrambler, or the Indian Scout Bobber. Bikes that have distinct stylistic choices beyond racetrack homologation, hell, some of the most popular motorcycles globally are from Royal Enfield if that tells you anything about where people's priorities lie. Also, did you know we have a Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 in the shop for our beginner bike giveaway? We already have some cool content on it as we plan to put it through its paces. It's worth going back and checking out if you want to hear us apologizing for our previous judgment of the platform, but this is actually a good segue into the last point I want to make. A huge factor for the success of brands like Royal Enfield is their accessible price points. Riders are more price conscious now than ever. You know things because they wage stagnation, housing costs, and inflation. And with increasing access to so much information when shopping for a motorcycle, it is really easy for people to leverage the value of a super sport against other options. Here's an example. Yamaha makes the R6, a screaming inline four that makes 117 horsepower at 14,500 RPM and 50 foot-pounds of torque at 10,500 RPM. The R6 has a few different rider modes and adjustable traction control, but otherwise it's a pretty stripped down with not too many farkles to mention. 
The bike demands an MSRP of $12,199 back when you could still get them before they discontinued it. Let's compare that with a naked bike like the Yamaha MT-09 that makes 119 horsepower at 10,000 RPM and 68 foot-pounds of torque at 7,000 from its inline three-cylinder engine. So not only is it more power from the MT-09 a lot more usable on the street, it comes with a TFT dash, six-axis IMU, an up-down quick shifter, oh yeah, and its MSRP is just $9,499. Another point I want to make is the prevalence of V4 engines. We talked about how MotoGP is not really that interesting to people nowadays, but the V4 platform is becoming more and more competitive, and it's harder and harder for inline fours to compete against it. The only inline four bike left on the MotoGP grid is the Yamaha. With Suzuki having left and Honda going with the V4 platform many, many years ago, every other bike on the grid is a V4. Compatted with the fact that most Ducatis and Aprilias nowadays also use V4 engines because of that oh so juicy character. Like I talked touched on earlier, inline four engines cost more to produce and are currently only really used in super sport style motorcycles that are designed for peak power at high revs. And if you don't intend on doing most of your riding on the track and you don't have that emotional connection to super sport style motorcycles that makes you want to Rossi cosplay on the street, it makes sense to go with really any other style of motorcycle. You can have a bike with more agreeable ergonomics, cooler style, more usable power, and a more exciting engine character for oftentimes less than the cost of an inline four super sport. And the other elephant in the room is that Japan printed out so many of these sport oriented inline four motorcycles that we'll be able to buy used versions of these bikes for probably the next 15 years in decent condition. I think a lot of riders are coming to this conclusion lately and motorcycle manufacturers are taking notice. And if manufacturers don't send these bikes to a farm upstate, the EPA might have to take them out the shed and do it themselves. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. Please take a second to subscribe and turn on notifications so you make sure to get all the sport bike content before these bikes go extinct. Fact, space partly smells like diesel fuel and barbecue. This is mainly due to the amount of dying stars in our galaxy. The combustion releases a compound called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Goodbye. Well, look at you. You've made it to the end of another Yammy Noob video. You should consider yourself pretty lucky because I have curated this one right over here for you to continue watching. It's probably just as good as the one you just saw. Unless you hated the one you just saw. I don't know. Maybe leave me a comment down below about how you much you hated it as well, too. Or just keep watching this one. Make sure you keep watching Yammy Noob. Don't forget to keep watching Yammy Noob. That's the most important thing. Keep watching Yammy Noob.